But essentially, I, I think um, that we had a very good meeting in the February Department Board. Um, it was essentially about um, the financial challenges we faced. Um, I think we left the room understanding how we were going to get through next year in terms of, of, of a budget for the system and, and who, where the risk lie, lay. But also I think we emerged with some key priority areas for everybody. Um, and a recognition, I think, by people who know this is not the plan of World Health and Care Commission, but actually it's everybody's to own and everybody's to put um, resource into um, in terms of, of delivery. Um, so it is an ambitious programme, um, it is extensive, um, we need to do some work over the summer period, um, post um, local authority elections, as I said earlier, with um, elected members themselves, but also with the wider public about what's in the long term plan and how healthy we're all response to that. But not just looks towards Cheshire, Mersey, and beyond, but it's actually about a rural program that needs to be owned by local people. Um, and as I said earlier, those people are also, many of them, and the people who work in those services. Then you want to add, David? Just to say, just to sort of endorse the fact that I think what we uh, agreed at our February meeting is uh, a sort of next level up from where we've been before about working together to solve each other's problems rather than mm -hmm. just stick with our own organisations and try and solve those problems. And I think the proof will be in the pudding, um, and that's the next challenge is to ensure that people don't revert to Titan work in their own silo, that they actually work together to solve some of the problems that we've got as a system. Um, I'm resident of the system, so I do see the continued duplication um, that actually this process can cut through and start to, um, um, you know, start to make the best use of our resources. We are not using our resources to their fullest um, degree at the current, current time. And, you know, by doing that, we get better services for the amount of money we've been given. That's what we're doing. Okay. Well, that's Oh, can I just, on page 84, sorry, yeah, um, the, the financial yeah. table. Yes. Any million pounds off the plan in yes. January 2019, should we be concerned? Right. The position we feel we will end the year is that actually three of the four organisations will get over the line and achieve balance or their plan services. That will leave the hospital trust significantly adrift. Um, therefore, next year, um, what we've said is there is a potential for 19 million additional funding um, for the system, um, as in, as in, um, for the providers within the system. That's meant that the commissioner um, has had to accept another six, has to take six million risk extra in order to get that in. So what we're trying to do in all cases is operate as a system. So previously it would have all gone as four organisations and gone help a lever to achieve our own financial targets and all that does end up with a, a, a financial shin kicking contest and um, it's ultimately a waste of everybody's efforts but actually what we should be looking at is the solution. So I think yes we should be concerned about it because we're clearly adrift financially. Um, where we think we will be is that the um, I'm looking for some wood or something to touch. But we're, we're looking that we would achieve um, for the commission side for the community trust and Cheshire World Partnerships a balanced position. But we know that the position of the uh, hospital trust has worsened. And it has worsened because of the elective activity they were intending to undertake have not been able to undertake because of um, the pressure on um, beds from people waiting for discharge and other issues. Um, then non-elective um, activity in the last quarter has actually gone down. So fewer people are attending and being admitted. And that's largely because some of the work that the neighbourhoods have been doing around um, high intensity uses in frailty. Um, which is, uh, so, so as I said, rather than having those conversations in individual silos, these are the conversations we're now having in the room. I'm saying, well, we need to help the hospital next year get as much resource in the national as we possibly can in order for them to
to um, create a space to make the change, which means outpatient redesign. It means, therefore, uh, starting to take cost out in terms of some beds they know what they need. It means it's working with them on improving uh, flow through and discharge. So, as, as you will see from the report, we present that to you. When we originally started off on Healthy World, the financial sustainability was the first bullet point, but I think we realised very quickly, unless you act as one, you're not going to work through the other things back. Is it a sustainable service? Are we delivering good outcomes? Are we improving quality? If you don't do them first, the financial challenge is not going to be met. So, so, so that's a long way to so, 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 so what's the right board with that? All those changes, um, are they? They have been. They're changing they're their culture. They're changing, they're changing their, their culture. They've signed a memorandum of understanding with us all in the system that we will commit to working in that way. Um, they were definitely in the after death in the 28th. Um, and um, the, the financial whiz kids left the room and uh, came up with the financial solution that benefits the system next year. As I said, it means some of the risk is transferred to the CCG part of the budget, but six million um, risk there is a net 13 million gain in the system and gives us the opportunity to change. And frankly, Phil, the point that you're, I think it's underlying what you're saying of really, do we actually act as one? Well? Um, was exactly the reason that, that we realised that we needed an independent chair. We need somebody who is not a member of any of our organisations to hold to that memorandum of understanding that has been signed by all organisations because um, when things are tough, you have to be reminded of that then. Um, but that's exactly why I don't think it was brought in. I mean, the, sign, the signs are, have been good. I mean, I'm very simple. Like, if you think about the health system, you've got, you, you know, it, it, it has a flow. The hospital trust is this bit in the middle. You've got how you get people out and support them in the community. You've got how you stop them going into hospital. So we're a system. And you can't point to any one part of that system and say it's bad. Just the whole thing's not working properly. And I gave a, a case study of me and my daughter, um, you know, in our experience of flowing through the system the other week, which shows that actually all bits of the system are not acting, you know, to, 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 to optimum. Uh, and, and therefore, what we've got to do is challenge people going, oh, I've got to solve my problem because it's a system problem. Uh, we've got to actually work together on how those bits fit together and how the flow works best. And what we can do it. Stuff that's going on in the neighbourhoods is a key part of obviously how we locate stuff close to people so that it actually prevents them needing to go to the hospital. We've got loads to do in the hospital that the hospital process streamlined, working around people, uh, etc. And we've still got loads to do in terms of how do we actually discharge people from the hospital. And I think that, um, and that's again where I'm working properly between GP, land, care homes to make sure people can go back into their homes um, you know, quickly. And I would even write packages around them from the neighbourhoods and all these sorts of things. That's the sort of area. So we're not pointing at anybody and saying you're the one that's doing the bad job. We're saying how do we improve the system so that you can do your job better. And in a sense, um, although it's always sad to hear that yes, there are problems throughout the entire system, but um, it, that's good that we can see problems in our books because that's the things that we can do something about. So it's easy, but we can, because I don't know how you'd solve those figures if you couldn't see any problems throughout the system. If you felt that it was running as efficiently <coughs> as it possibly could do, then you're not going to solve that. But we know there are things to work on, so that's what we've got to do. Good to hear, Phil. Yes. I don't think what uh, Simon was saying that there would be workshops or briefings for elected members. Because even though I sit on mental health and care, and even though I'm the governor of a particular hospital trust, interest in, if I was not involved in them, I'd have some difficulty in getting the understanding of what actually being done. So uh, in the past, you have the silos, people defending their budgets, so I understand all the move away from that. But for most citizens, the first thing they hear about is number of beds, and providing number of beds, and in the past,
cast the situation was we must have more beds because we must have more beds in the room. And that we're trying to get away from having beds in wards. Well, the first thing that people are the different from the telly or whatever hospital program they watch on the telly is people in corridors and the rest of it. So I'm trying to ensure that we understand <coughs> as members of the council how it might be improved yeah. for people that might be in the system and need the help. So we, we've um, contacted committee services in the top, um, last week um, and asked for a placeholder to be put in for um, full council for a, 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 an all members workshop one evening in uh, May or June. And then it's actually in the work plan, it was in last night's mm -hmm. work plan for um, adult uh, yeah. care and health and also uh, children's. And again, we're proposing that we do the section 75, um, a joint workshop, so we can see the whole piece. Um, but then there would be a, a common report that goes to both committees. Um, we would want to then furnish those workshops probably with somebody who knows about the finances um, and again can, can explain that in more, more detail. Um, also, uh, clinicians who can explain how work, this is going to, you know, the clinical redesign is going to uh, make a significant difference, as well as, I suppose, the social redesign we're doing with, with social prescribing um, and more um, services in, in local, local areas. So, uh, that's the plan. Okay, anybody else on this report? No? Okay, thanks, Simon. Um, which takes us on then to uh, 6.3, which is uh, the public health report, health protection, a call to action. Julie, you'll take us with this, please. Yeah, thank you, Jay. Um, I suppose whilst we're the changing in the system, things are being done differently, this report, I suppose, is just really a reminder that we've still got the basics that we need to get right. Um, as an acting director of public health, I have an assurance role um, to make sure that we've got a good, effective, efficient health protection um, service system globally, which I discharge through the health protection forum, which is outlined in the paper, and that gets reported into the healthy, healthy world system. I thought it was important to bring the attention of the health and wellbeing board to uh, the challenges that we've got with regard to health protection and the work that we're planning during 2019-20 to actually move this forward. Um, I think as the report says, what we've done is a, a call to action uh, made to our health and care partners. Um, actually, as I'm saying that, I think there's also a lot of work to be done with local people around the importance of the uh, issues that are raised within, within this paper. Uh, it, the paper outlines why this is still really important and it hasn't gone away. And actually just today um, we've had notification of a, a monks outbreak um, over in uh, Liverpool, particularly focused on students. Uh, and we will be um, pushing uh, communications out into the system to ensure people are aware of the importance of having your MMR, no matter what your age, because uh, I think this is absolutely what we're seeing here is a, an impact of the Andrew Wakefield um, reporting where um, parents decided not to have their children vaccinated by um, vaccinated, and we're now seeing the uh, appearance of childhood illnesses in our young, young adults. So it's, it's not going away, and that's really what this report is about. It's about focusing on getting the, uh, getting the basics right, and we've identified three areas that we absolutely need to, to focus on. Uh, we do a lot of work, obviously, particularly with our health and care providers, around <coughs> prevention and control, work closely with Paula, uh, within the community trust, work closely with CWB and with, with our Park Hospital as well. So you'll see within the paper the action we want to do around infection prevention and control, some of which actually is just about making sure people wash their hands and making sure that healthcare professionals are burr below the elbow so that we don't have that risk of infection. Um, reducing antimicrobial resistance, uh, there's been a lot of um, coverage around this and the Chief Medical Officer, certainly during the time she's been in post, has pushed this really hard. And then they're certainly talking to general practice, this is probably something where we need to do a lot of work with the general public 
where there is an expectation around if you go to see a GP, you will have an antibiotic prescribed. But we're seeing the impact of too much prescribing of antibiotics causing <coughs> antimicrobial uh, resistance. And then finally is um, the work that we need to do around the variation we have locally around the uptake of cancer screening and immunisation programmes. And it was the annual report, the annual public health report, the one before last, we focused on health inequalities, and one of the big areas we highlighted there was the variation in uptake across the rural. I don't need to tell you that uptake was lower in the east compared to the west. And I think probably this is something we want to explore a lot more through the neighbourhood work around what's the different approaches that we need to adopt. How do we work much more closely with local people to understand why they aren't uptaking the screening uh, and immunisation programmes and do some significant stick. So really I just wanted to bring this paper together today rather, um, just so that people in this room are aware, because actually it's not just a health and social care system that can help with this, it's everybody within the room that can help us get these messages across. Uh, I just wanted to work, I wanted the uh, health and wellbeing board to know the call to action and um, to ask for your support when we ask for it. Okay, thanks Julie. Questions, comments, Phil? Go back to all the hand washing and all the things we talk about, um, prevention, disease, spread and so on, the key three things you talked about, the report we've also talked about, air uh, quality. So, the simple things, probably the immunisation and everything else, the air quality needs to be part of a longer term or not too longer term vision about what to do. If I go back 15 years to wherever primary school near a particular bit of road, we used to do lead monitoring on the playground. Now, we've got equipment in various places and little pots that collect samples and all the rest of it and there in the annual air quality report and a few um, devices placed alongside particular key routes got very bypass and a gadget in Tranmere that collects lots of data from ministry. So I read in the various documents that the Mayor of Merseyside and the Council are working closely, they're going to work closely in the future of their quality. So do we have, if we're focusing on infection and all that stuff in the short term, are we bringing together a longer term plan? which explains to all those parents sitting in their cars outside their schools with their engines running and all the rest of it, that this is no longer a good idea because I read somewhere that when now some councils are going to have monitoring equipment with children at the level they walk at in the street so we can see exactly what they're getting and what the kiddie, the buggy who's being pushed along the streets in this lower level of air pollution is, is actually breathing in. So are we beginning to pull together that as part of a campaign that goes beyond what's in this paper. I can't give you the level of detail that you're, you're probably looking for at the moment, Councillor, but yes, uh, through the environmental work that we're doing, and the environmental health does report into the Health Protection Forum around our local action around clean air and, and, and air quality. There's also lots of work, which I'm sure you're aware of, around the eco-schools and schools taking the responsibility to I think, talk to their parents about action, because this also links to um, are the children walk, walking to school, are you know, using their bikes. So there's, there's lots of different elements, as, you, as I know you're aware, in, within that question that you've asked me. So we are working on this with environmental health colleagues. They do report into the Health Protection Forum, but I suppose the this paper is particularly focusing on um, the key, from the data that we've got, the key areas that we really need to get the health and social care area to focus on. But through the Health Protection Forum, we do bring in the other items. And I'm sure we'll hear more about air pollution because I know Public Health England are wanting to do significant work there. And we need to understand through the long term plan uh, what actions uh, are going to come through that way as well. And as you said, Phil. Uh, Steve Rodman has established a, an air quality commission with people from each of the six boroughs on to try and look at this in more this issue in more detail and hopefully come up with a credible kind of plan to help us address those those issues you've mentioned. So I think
think there's going to be a lot of work on, on air quality next you know, next year. So it'd be good to bring that back to to this order. I think for regular updates. Yeah. Okay. Any, anybody else? No. Okay. So. Together 
in order to be able to make sure that we're pricing people effectively in the mass of those long stay hospitals so they can live in their own communities. Um, one of the things that's been very helpful in that is having our resources together in one place. That's, that's going to be um, some of the functional things that the board has, has been able to sign off is a joint single commissioning transformation strategy, um, healthy rural outcome measures for the population. So that what we've got is a set of measures that are from cradle to grave in terms of those sorts of things that are really important to the local population that are signed off for healthy care system. And again, that's to be built into all of our contracts. So contracts start to become outcome-focused contracts rather than widget counting, if you like, and um, single interventions. So it goes some way to challenge the traditional <coughs> way of working that we've had across the health and care system uh, in terms of payment by results and those types of things. It's the results here are very much about the population health outcomes and supporting people. So everyone's got the report, I don't, I don't think I need to say any more about the content of the report, which we have to open to questions. Okay, thanks Joe. Anybody got any questions? No? Okay, so we'll, we'll note that report. Yes? Thanks Joe. And now you're going to do a rural neighbourhoods update. Yes. And, and again, I'll, I'll let through this, it's quite a lot of slides and um, um, in retrospect, um, some of these I've been covered in in some way, shape, or form so far. But uh, I will wrap up for you and uh, give, give the opportunity to come in afterwards. Um, so, neighbourhoods are about people and place, they're not about health and care, and they're not about the organisations that we all work for. And that's absolutely fundamental, and you'll see here a very strong thread between healthy women and the neighbourhoods. All of the key principles are there. And all of the key principles of what's currently the 2020 vision for women, again, are there and embedded within, within our approach. So what we're focusing on is building capacity in local communities. And the aim is that those local communities are very much wrapped around people and supporting people to be the best that they can be in their local area. So it's very much a place-based system. Within that, we've clearly got some very specific health and care things going on as well. But our primary aim is to focus on the place and how people are supported in their local lives. So some key principles, again, you'll, you'll recall these from um, Simon's presentation before. Partnership is key, and we organisations like Age UK and Corp are as important to this process as our big NHS providers and our social care providers. Because what they're bringing is an, a huge added dimension. We eventually see a whole army of people out there that are supporting people in, to, to know what's going on in their area, to be engaged in their area, and to enable people to be as well and as functional as they can be. So this is a, an NHS slide, but, but actually I think this is probably helpful in just in terms of where neighbourhoods sit in the overall plan for health and care. So neighbourhood is the 30 to 50,000 population, very much about how we can work and develop networks at that sort of level, so that what we've got is things that are really tightly linked together. Place, or borough in our case, is the typically a 250 to 500,000 uh, population. What that enables us to do is to plan engage with local democracy to be able to ensure that what we've got is oversight of a system at for a level. That's an incredibly important level for us here in rural. And I don't think there's any conflict with us being able to work strategically at a level on anything that's going on in the NHS. This is actually a, a slide from the NHS, so it's, you know, it shows how we, how we can fit really nicely into the system. Then of course we've got Cheshire and Merseyside, and Cheshire Merseyside is really important when we're thinking across the whole health and care system around some of the more uh, specialist types of services that people have. So when we start to think about things like cancer treatments and pathways, we start to think about a much bigger pathway, uh, although there's examples of that as well. And the, um, I mentioned there in the studies before, although that works 
on a local level, actually it works on that Cheshire and Mersey level as well, and we're able to access NHS England funding to enable us to do some things locally to improve our local service offer and to be able to offer different types and levels of services to people, particularly for those with the highest level of need. And of course, finally, the, the regional level, which is uh, much larger and much, much more than how those um, systems are held to account. Okay, so uh, place based care and practice. Um, this is quite health and care all oriented as a slide. Um, but what we're really trying to indicate here is that integrated multidisciplinary teams are an absolute key jigsaw piece for this. So moving people um, from the council into NHS organisations has been really helpful to get people sitting next to each other and to work as multidisciplinary teams. Um, in the first year, they're focused mainly on frail old people and people who are what are termed as frequent, frequent users of NHS services, but those people who have multiple admissions into hospital. And what they're able to do is be much more proactive uh, with those people. We've also, at the same time, however, had some really good success in terms of some lower level voluntary sector work, and I'll come to that again in a moment, where Age UK have uh, provided um, prove, um, independent school or so pick workers, as they're called. Um, to look at the low level of ways that we can support people and uh, the slide that's on that helps us to describe that. And of course, uh, this links in with um, other um, people like community connectors and a whole range of, of other people. So, linkage with healthy rural, I think we probably had this slide earlier, so we're going to get a few slides that look quite similar today. But again, what people can say is there's an absolute um, clear link between what we're trying to do at the native level and our aim to help people live longer and healthier lives and to improve their health and well being. It's very much a population based approach. <coughs> the slide you've seen uh, once before, however, what you'll see on this slide that uh, there's some new names starting to emerge. So, um, when we originally um, talk, talked about names being better than they, better than being all those sorts of things. Um, they were names that were made up in a planning sense, if you like, based on lower CPAP areas. But as those neighbourhoods have been getting together and working closely, some of them have said, we don't want a crappy name, but <laughs> some planner of uh, the council was made up, not a proper name. So we're seeing some proper names emerging, like Morton and Liso, Healthier South Wirral. And actually, you know, I, I think it's really good that they're emerging from the neighbourhoods, as opposed from to uh, we've got an idea. I am hoping that Birkin A is Birkin and North, but we'll see. It could be something else altogether. Um, I'll nip past this slide, but it wasn't before. No. So, place based care and enabled actually really is really good for staff across all organisations. And this, this is really one of the key features that we think is important when people are thinking about what this means. Because they do get to know each other, some of the, the mistrust and the difficulties of working across organisations within very tight processes are the sorts of things that they're finding they can, they can work through much better. And um, a big focus uh, of our work is on the cultural shift that's required really to work in a system as opposed to within your own organisation. Uh, in terms of basic, basic care and being better for people, our focus is absolutely on people that require our support and have an interest in them coming up with solutions as opposed to we've got an offer to sell you, you either fit it or not, which is kind of the way organisations are structured um, over a number of years. The multidisciplinary team approach is very much about understanding what's going on around the individual. The other challenge that we've got going forward, but it's, it's a key shift in the same way. When um, our systems have been developed, so for example, if you think about the mental health system, then the mental health system is designed around a patient to come to have some treatment uh, that's dealt with the take the medication or whatever go away. It doesn't really think necessarily it isn't structured in such a way that thinks about that person, where they live, their family, their community, what's going on around them. So what we hope is that we can bring these two things together and they make much better. And Suzanne knows about this and numerous stories of how um, you know, people have been supported through thinking about what's really important to them as opposed to the focus being on their, on their health. So 
So a number of uh, achievements have been made and uh, in essence they're about creating the framework for neighbourhoods and the first, um, if you like, elements of care and health that have, that have been developed in the world. The, the, the best bit of this, I think, has been those third sector links and how they enable us to strengthen the, the care and health response. Also, the data that's coming through uh, population health intelligence is enabling those neighbours to know what the differences are. So in each area there are some fundamental differences in terms of the health outcomes for that population. And one of the key jobs that the GPs that lead this are looking at going forward is well, how can we focus in on those issues for this particular population. Um, we also had a piece of work that commissioned through AGK where they talked to in some detail older people, got some insight into what their priorities and issues are. What we found that whilst there were some similarities across the name and input, there were also some significant differences in terms of what people saw as being important. So for some areas, loneliness and isolation were actually far more important issues than, um, if you like, uh, how, how uh, people feel about the environment and how one way or other they So that's enabled us to start to think about what the priorities are different in a single framework we'll have different priorities for each of those areas. So that's been really helpful. Um, I'm just flashing this up. We saw we have the rural programme structure, very similar sort of programme structure here for neighbourhoods. Formal programme, we've got people like Jamie Anderson of Age UK um, delivering the work stream around frailty. We've got Jennifer Dodd who um, works for the um, World Community Foundation Trust um, developing the strategic action. There's a whole range of different people that are uh, taking a, a strong lead in each of these areas. It's enabling us to run as a formal programme with strong governance arrangements around it. There you go, I'm going to flip past that. Okay, so this slide is simply to um, illustrate uh, how the personal independence coordinators have made a difference. So, it was, a, it was a pilot with AGK and the personal independence coordinators focused on, you know, volunteers, they focused in on those people that were having lots of appointments with their GP to understand why, why this person was having so many appointments. So as you can see on the left hand side, number of patients with multiple tens of appointments within a 12 month period and a 6 month period. And what they did is they, they focused in to see what the issues were. One lady here, for example, um, just simply wasn't hydrating enough. So the provision of a, one of these, exactly the same sort of thing, with a measure on the side, would enable her to know just how much fluid she was taking, a bit of advice and support in terms of taking this fluid, made a huge difference, reduced her um, visits to the doctor down significantly. As you can see here, those sorts of interventions that are non-medical, non-clinical, very straightforward sort of approach is having a huge impact on, on the health system in terms of those people. Being sure that the people who go to the GP are people that really need to go to the GP because they're in as opposed to it for these other things. So we see that these types of approaches can have a massive impact and actually can reduce admissions to hospital and, and that's been one of the key benefits we've seen. So uh, I've set, set out in, in the presentation some of the uh, immediate priorities. Um, again, um, working together with colleagues to ensure that um, population health management, social prescribing, we have a coordinated approach. There is a risk of being able to the, a level of fragmentation where different things are happening all over the world. So another key challenge going forward is to make sure that what we're learning in one area is shared with another area so that we can take all the best elements and make sure they're working together really well. There is a risk that primary care networks develop on a different footprint, so what we're trying to do is um, work with the um, GP leaders to talk about how primary uh, support primary care so that they're um, in support of working on this kind of major footprint. And we, we should see that the primary care networks in the neighbourhood are very similar. There may be some minor differences in the edges, but they should be very similar. Um, the final structure of primary care 
I still need to be sat up by the FSC and the CCG within this. So, you know, there's so many routes there. Um, quite important to say that the there's a lot of money coming down to those primary care networks. So, several million pounds can be direct through and as you see, we need to, to enable uh, the development of the networks and to really, we think, get behind a model that we think is a very effective model. So, um, if we can have the alignment um, strong, then I think that's going to be a great benefit to, to the world. Uh,